Greetings. My name is Mike Levis and I'm an instructor with the Mountain Hood Ski Patrol Avalanche Program. This is the first module in our Avalanche Level 2 program. Some of the material in this module will be a review of Level 1 material. If you feel the need for a deeper review of Aval Avalanche Level 1 material, please go back and re-watch the Level 1 videos on the Mountain Hood Ski Patrol Avalanche YouTube channel. The learning objectives of Avalanche Level 2 are fundamentally different than Level 1. In Level 1, we focused on the basics, how to use a beacon, how to evaluate terrain for hazards, how to be part of a companion rescue activity, as some examples. In Level 2, we focus on the objectives shown here. We'll do a deeper dive into snow science and the impact of weather, terrain, and snowpack on avalanche risk. For example, in level one, you learned how to describe what you saw in the snowpack layers in a snow pit. In level two, we focus on understanding how these layers may have formed. You will learn how to do your own avalanche hazard assessment and create your own forecast using a model called the conceptual model of avalanche hazard. There's a strong emphasis on leadership in travel and rescue scenarios. In level one, much of the emphasis is on the process of trip planning and rescue execution. In level two, the emphasis is on leadership of all, of all aspects of planning and execution of travel and rescue scenarios. So let's get started on our avalanche level two journey. By way of review, this slide shows our old friend, the avalanche triangle. This is the basic model you learned in AVI one to show the relationship between the variables that determine avalanche risk, snowpack, weather, and terrain. Starting with module two, we're going to do a very deep dive into these variables. But for now, let's just blow off the cobwebs and review the triangle. So let's start with the factor we can control, terrain. The key question in any terrain is, is the terrain capable of producing an avalanche? This includes the terrain we are on, as well as the terrain above us. The second leg of the avalanche triangle is snowpack. We'll look much more deeply into snowpack structure in subsequent modules, but the key question is the same. Is the snowpack stable or unstable? What are the structures in the snowpack that affect snowpack stability? Do we have a consolidated layer over a weak layer that could result in a slab avalanche? The last leg of the avalanche triangle is weather. Weather is often referred to as the architect of the avalanche because the weather creates the snowpack through wind and precipitation. On any given slope, the snowpack reflects the weather history that the slope has been exposed to over the winter up to that point in time. Much like rings on a tree trunk, the snowpack reflects weather history. Precipitation, snow or rain and how much? Wind, how much, for how long, and in what direction, and temperature profile. Let's review the difference between avalanche potential and avalanche risk. The legs of the avalanche triangle describe avalanche potential and try and answer the key question, what's the likelihood of an avalanche? The inside of the triangle describes the avalanche hazard or avalanche risk. Avalanche hazard describes the consequences of a slide on life and property. If you spend any time on YouTube looking at avalanche videos, you frequently see skiers, snowboarders, and snowmobilers triggering an avalanche and then appearing to outrun the avalanche. Usually their path is to the side, out of the slide path. While this looks impressive, the statistics would indicate this is not likely the case for most avalanches. A typical slab is quite large half the size of a football field and one to two feet deep and reaches a speed of about 80, second, 80 miles per hour in six seconds. As the slab accelerates, it appears to shatter like a pane of glass. It is not likely you'll be able to outrun a slab if it breaks with you on it. So the best strategy is not to get caught in an avalanche to begin with. This slide shows some of the damage inflicted by avalanches. You can see in the picture on the right, that's a snowcat upside down. It's been tipped over by the force of the avalanche. So these avalanches have a lot of energy and can do a lot of damage. 
Let's shift gears and quickly review the avalanche accident statistics in the United States and try to answer two key questions. Who is the typical avalanche victim and what factors affect avalanche survivability? Much of the data we're going to be looking at today comes from the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. This is a resource that tracks accident statistics in the U.S. I would encourage you to bookmark this URL and check it out when you get a chance. Before we dive into the material, what can you notice about this photo? Other than the large slab avalanche, do you see the people in the upper left? What decisions do you think these people made to avoid becoming a statistic? When we talk about avalanche survivability, rule number one is don't get caught in an avalanche to begin with. So what are the chances of surviving if you're caught in an avalanche? As we'll, we will see in the following slides, survivability depends on several, statistics, several factors. How deeply are you buried? Are you wearing a beacon? Were you injured in the avalanche? And how quickly were you uncovered? The first key statistic to keep in mind is that 20 to 25% of avalanche victims are killed by trauma before they are buried. So remember num rule number one, don't get caught in an avalanche to begin with. This slide shows the probability of survival as a function of time buried. Note this is only for victims that are not killed by blunt force trauma. The thick red li line is the 50% survival point. As you can see for our maritime snowpack with heavy wet snow that sets up like concrete, the 50% survival point is roughly 15 minutes. Regions with lighter, drier snow have 50% survival times of 20 to 30 minutes. So if you think about a typical burial scenario, you have 15 minutes to locate the victim and dig them out before their odds of survival have dropped by 50%. Seconds really do matter in these rescues. The next slide indicates the timing of avalanche accidents throughout the year. No surprise here, accidents happen in those months of the year with the heaviest snowfall. 85% of the accidents occur in the December through April window. Please note this is data from North America, so data will be different for other parts of the world. This slide shows the age distribution for avalanche accident victims. As you can see, most victims are 20 to 30 years of age. Most are also male. This slide shows where most avalanche accidents happen. As you can see, eight states, Colorado, Alaska, Washington, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and California account for the bulk of the accidents. Since this is where most of the backcountry outdoor activity occurs, this is real, not really a surprise. This slide shows the activity profile for avalanche accidents. Backcountry ski touring, snowmobiling, climbers, and side country riders account for the bulk of the accidents. This slide is particularly interesting. This slide shows that two-thirds of avalanche accidents involve victims that are not wearing beacons. As the slide notes, this is similar to statistics of drowning victims who are not wearing PFDs. The slide indicates ignorance is the leading cause of avalanche death, but probably it should really be stated as carelessness. This slide shows the trend in avalanche fatalities over time. As the data clearly indicates, there's a steady growth in fatalities over time. This slide also indicates when avalanche beacons were first available. We might ask why the level of accidents seems to be increasing, even with the wide availability of beacons. The answer to this has several dimensions. First, as the previous slide indicated, two-thirds of accident victims are not wearing beacons. So even though beacons are widely available, people are not using them enough. Secondly, the number of people participating in backcountry activity has been growing rapidly. More people in the backcountry means more people in avalanche accidents. Thirdly, and we'll cover this in more detail in the Human Factors module, there's an increase in risk tolerance as training and safety equipment becomes more available. Things like AVI-1 training, beacons, and airbags increase safety margins for backcountry activity, so people increase the risk level of the activity correspondingly. This slide shows survivability data for accidents as a function of burial time and burial depth. 
The circles are victims that were found alive and the small X's are for victims that were found dead. Let's look at the circles. The data shows that the likelihood of survivability increases significantly if burial depth is shallow, less than a meter, and time of burial is short, less than 15 minutes. That's that cluster of circles in the lower left-hand corner. The lesson here is that things like avalanche airbags and beacons can increase the likelihood of survival, survival by reducing burial depth and time. Also note that implicit in this is that people traveling in the backcountry practice using their beacons so they can quickly find a member of their party if caught in an avalanche. Note that this data is for survivability of buried victims who are not killed by trauma initially. There's a caveat in all this data. Many accidents, particularly if there is not a fatality, are not reported. So the level of avalanche accident activity is believed to be much higher, just not reported. The report, reported data is probably skewed toward fatalities. So that's the picture on avalanche accident statistics. Bottom line is the best way not to become a statistic is to not get caught in an avalanche to begin with. And this brings us back to the avalanche triangle. Terrain, is the slope steep enough to slide? Snowpack, is there a consolidated layer over a weak layer? Weather. Has the weather been changing rapidly, as in a lot of new snow over a short period of time, to increase instability? We're going to dig into all of these factors in a lot more detail over the next couple of modules. Thanks again for your time, and let's move on to, accident, uh, to avalanche nomenclature.